Hey, last all of us uh, visiting us and uh, uh, speaking at the Network Science Institute. So, uh, some of you know very well Laszlo's work, some of you may be new to it. Uh, Laszlo is a mathematician coming out from, that, uh, uh, from the school that gave us a series of fantastic mathematicians uh, from, uh, from Paul Adders, that many of you know, of course, about. Uh, 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 and he's probably one of the most uh, prominent uh, members of, of, uh, of his generations. Uh, he started out as a, as a young talent, uh, winning all the competitions in mathematics that you can imagine. And we just had a long discussion today at lunch about how important those competitions were actually for the generations of uh, mathematicians that uh, he was part of. Uh, and uh, he continued working in combinatorics and graph theory, both originally in Hungary and then he spent quite a bit of time in the US as well, if I remember at Yale University and then Microsoft, correct? And, and a few years ago, he has returned to Budapest, and uh, uh, a f and then a few years later, he was elected to be the uh, to be the president of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, a job that he is still holding for another two years. Uh, 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 as I said, Lasso's work spans quite a bit of area from dance graphs, type of areas that we're very interested in, to algorithms, and uh, he's a hero both to mathematicians as well as to many computer scientists. Uh, and uh, you know, when it comes to uh, to the school of mathematics that all of us network scientists are building, and you know, you actually find his name all over written. Uh, when I started working on my end on control, then I was very pleased to realize that the matching problems that we've been actually using were all summarized in the book that he has written, one of the several books that, that, that he wrote. <coughs> Needless to say, his work has been rewarded by quite a number of awards, from the Wolf Prize to the Kyoto Prize and many, many others that are too long to list. And so I will keep it short and give him the chance to speak. Uh, it's a true pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be able to speak here. I uh, apologize if uh, uh, sometimes maybe my mathematical background will uh, take me. Please interrupt if I am if I am getting too mathematical, but I try to. I want you to be mathematical, right? Well, I definitely want to be mathematical, but it also needs uh, sometimes explanation. Okay. So, uh, you have a graph or network. I will write. I will use these two words more or less interchangeably. I will talk about graph, which is sort of the mathematical name for it. And uh, divide and conquer is, is, a, <coughs> is a very, very old strategy where you want to partition whatever graph you have into small pieces, uh, maybe deleting as few edges or, or making as little change as possible. <coughs> and then you solve it for those. And here are some of the notions that graph theorists have developed in order to facilitate this kind of method. First, you decompose the graph into components, into two connected components, which are called blocks. Then there is a tree decomposition, uh, which is, corresponds to the important notion of tree width. Uh, related notions, branches, tree, tree depths, and so on. They all correspond to some kind of idea that you, you <coughs> want to split the graph into small pieces and solve the problem separately and then somehow build together these, uh, whatever you obtain from these pieces. Uh, one of these which might be interesting at this point is that uh, uh, three bits is one of the deep, deeper ones among these uh, notions. It, sort of measures how tree-like is the graph, not doesn't have to be a tree, it can be like a fat tree. And uh, it was very successfully used in many places, among other in the, in the uh, researchers at that core in the 1980s and 1990s, observed that many real-life networks have small tree bits. 
probably comes from the fact that they were looking at uh, like telephone networks, but, okay. and they are sort of gradually developed. So you have some network, and then you want to expand it a little bit, and so on, and so clearly you get this kind of thing. Like uh, thing. Um, now, I would like to formulate a very simple version, mathematically simplest version of this par graph partition problem. We just want to delete a small number of edges so that if you delete these edges, the remaining graph has small components. So it splits the graph to uh, components which have at most k nodes. And uh, I denote by uh, sub k of g, the, it's basically the minimum number of edges you have to delete from a graph to get only small components. But you normalize it by n, which always denotes the number of nodes. Uh, it might be more natural to normalize by the number of edges, but I will be interested in graphs which have bounded degrees, and then it doesn't make they are proportional number of edges, number of nodes are proportional. Um, for k equals two, if you think about it, uh, you you want to delete as many, as few edges, so that the remainder has only components of size two, this is the matching problem. Whatever it is, you want to find the maximum matching in a graph. Uh, so, and for k equals three, it's a similar problem that includes, it contains a similar problem that you can delete, but then you have disjoint triangles partitioning all the points, it's called the triangle matching. It's not equivalent, but it contains this triangle matching problem, <coughs> best that you can have. And uh, now the first one is polynomially <coughs> solvable, but it's a difficult problem. It's a, it's a famous <coughs> matching algorithm that gives a polynomial time solution to this problem. For k equals three, it's an anti-hard problem. So uh, we, we run into this difficulty. So it's NP hard, so what can you ask for? You can <coughs> ask for approximation. Now, from the point of view of my more recent interest in very large graphs and very large networks, uh, polynomial solvability is not necessarily the, the kind of measure, complexity measure that you want to, want to use, because uh, mostly these networks are uh, not uh, available completely. Algorithms. I will come to this in a minute. So, so these results don't really tell the story from our point of view, from this large point of view. Um, now, so the problem to find that. So suppose we look. Let's look at this, this this case which we know how to solve. Find the perfect matching in G. But now let's try to uh, see what. How would we state this problem for a very large network? And there are several models for that. Uh, and since I'm a mathematician, I, I will try to make construct clean models. So, and then of course I I I, I throw up my hands when anybody says that in practice this is not quite what you want to do. <coughs> so here is a clean model. It's a called distributed algorithm for bounded graphs. Um, the model in one version is that you think of this graph and you assume that ev at every node there is a certain processor or agent sitting and they can do com uh, computation and I, I, I don't restrict their, their power. And they can communicate along the edges, but I only give them a bounded amount of communication per person. So each person can has money to make at most a thousand phone calls. So can they find a perfect matching? Now what would finding a perfect matching mean is that uh, every one of them has to know with whom he is matched with. And this should be mutual. And of course, you, it's easy to see that you must allow a certain amount of errors, 
Uh, and I don't want to go into the technical details of that. It's actually a little bit tricky and non-trivial to see what uh, the role of randomness. There's some randomization you have to allow here. If you think of this graph as just a single huge ring, single huge cycle, and then locally every, it always looks the same. So if they follow the same algorithm, then each of them will either try to pair with its right neighbor or its left neighbor and nothing comes out. Uh, it turns out that if they are allowed to flip coins, then they can match most of, most of the Thing, but there will be some errors necessarily that's no way to, uh, to avoid. Another, so randomization, I just warned that this, is, this has to be here. Another uh, notion is sometimes called local algorithms. It's the same graph, but now we, we just have a single agent who sits at a node and has to decide which neighbor he should be matched with in a possible perfect matching in the whole graph. Now this looks like a very different question, but actually it's an equivalent question. So uh, this, it's not hard to see that this guy can explore. I mean, he is, he is allowed to explore a bounded neighborhood of his <coughs> location, and so he can basically do all the computation for the neighbors, or for those who are at a bounded distance. And father guys don't play any role because their information never reaches him anyway. And Lotzi, you're using matching in the sense to find the uh, color of the bond such that no two, one, each <coughs> yeah. node should have only so one bond. So by matching, I mean that each node should have exactly one pair. Okay. Uh, that, or here I allow that each node should have, almost every node should have exactly one pair. So one pair only connected to one other guy. Yes. Yeah. And that should be mutual. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually doable uh, in this model. Um, that was Nguyen uh, and uh, Onak's result uh, already maybe 15 years ago. So, so this is doable in this, this model. <coughs> and uh, let me go on. And there is a related model of property testing unbounded degree graphs where it's, it's, it's quite similar, but now you have a single outside guy, a single main guy, and he can test various points and explore these points, what is their bounded neighborhood, and, and then he does some pre-processing, and then after that, if anybody comes to him with any node, pointing at every, any node, and asking whom should this node be matched with, then he can give the answer. That's again So these are all sorts of related models for algorithms on, on these local algorithms on these very large graphs. Now, I will uh, generalize this instead of very large graphs to infinite graphs, because the infinite is a good approximation of the very large finite. And uh, it's usually a cleaner model than the, infinite, than the very large finite. Uh, so you, you see better what is doable. So now I have to be a little, uh, do a little mathematics here. So we have a standard probability space, but you can think of the interval 0, 1. Uh, and we have a Borel graph, which is just any graph. The vertices are the, all the points between zero and one, so it's not even a countable graph. It's an uncountable graph. Uh, and the edges have to form a Borel set, and if you don't know what it means, you shouldn't worry, because any set you ever going to construct is a Borel <coughs> set. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is a technical condition. But there is an important condition here, and uh, this means that if you count the, this is the degree of x into b, how many edges go from x to b. And uh, so a and b are two subsets, and you count how many edges go from x to this subset b, and you integrate this over the set a, you have to get the same result if you count how many 
times a and the integrate of b. Uh, so it's sort of double counting. And in finite, in the finite case, that's just uh, trivial. It always holds. But in the infinite case, that's that's not. Right. A and b fixed to the variant. Sorry. Are a and b variant here. Uh, a and B. Uh, yeah, that has to hold for every two measurable sets A and B. Yeah. So, so you, this allows you double counting. So that's the notion of Agafi. And uh, I just mentioned that this actually gives you a measure. So if we denote this by E tau of uh, A cross B, then this gives you a measure on the edges, so you can talk about a random edge, and you can talk about 5% uh, of the ed of all edges, and things like that. Uh, without this, it would already be a problem, because this would count the same set of edges, but would assign to it so two different measures. So you, you, you better have that in order to be able to talk about even things like uh, you know, uh, epsilon fraction of all edges. So it's for the edge measure. Now, these graphings actually they have been a bit of a surprise maybe 10, 15 years ago when they, 10, 12 years ago when they came up, because all of a sudden it turned out that this same notion came, came up in uh, at least two different fields. It's, uh, it's used in ergodic theory, which is, what about that, not so much. Uh, they are just uh, the same as, they're somehow closely related to, uh, to finitely generated groups, and they are uh, Cayley graphs, and uh, they also came up as limit <laughs> objects for convergent graph sequences with bounded degree. So if you have a sequence of finite graphs, but it's just the members are grow larger and larger. <coughs> and you want to, and they all have bounded degrees. They do agree at most n. And now you want to define when this sequence is convergent. And that was done by Benjamin and Schramm, and they defined uh, that the sequence is convergent. If for every such graph, you can do a, a neighborhood statistic. You can, you can look at a random point, explore its neighborhood to a radius of 100, and then uh, this gives you, uh, and then there is a certain prob probability uh, of what you see there. So there's a finite number of possible neighborhoods, and you, you get a probability distribution on them. And if these probabilities tend to a limit as the graph gets larger and larger, then you say that the sequence is convergent. Clearly convergent in everyday, uh, sort of from our point of view of these, about these local algorithms, convergent just means that the graphs are less and less distinguishable by local algorithms. So every local algorithm will more and more behave in the same way on these graphs. As the graphs get larger and larger, and now the question is, do these graphs have certain limits? So it's convergent, it should have a limit, and it turns out that these graphings are in fact have good objects to represent these limits, but I won't, I'm not going to go uh, more into this. So is there a simple graphing. definition of what a graphing is? Yeah, here, here is the definition. <laughs> <laughs> but I will show you a few examples. Okay. So actually, uh, these are all examples of, <coughs> of graphings. Uh, what in, so what does it mean? It means that it's, it's like the adjacency matrix, but of course, since it's an infinite graph, it's not a matrix. So these are the points of the graph. This is the same set as this one. And <coughs> this point is connected to this and connected to that. So it's like the adjacency matrix of the graph. But now, uh, instead of a one, you just have a single point. And uh, uh, as you see, and in fact, it can be shown that any collection of 45 degree lines uh, is, is such a graphing. Uh, I mean, it has to be symmetric, 
course, because we are talking about undirected graphs. But here there are infinitely many short and short intervals. But in the fact that their lines come from this bounded degree, I guess, uh, or he, well, the 45 that <coughs> comes from the measure preserved. No, but the fact that there are lines, can you also, be, I guess, as soon as you have blocks, right, then you get unbounded degrees. Yes, yeah, 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 that's lines. right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it has to be a one dimensional object. Yeah. But the degree is bounded on in expectation. No, no, no. no. So this is if, absolute bounded. If it's, uh, if it's bounded in expectation, it's not exactly. Um, if it's bounded in expectation, it's a difficult uh, area. And uh, uh, it's, it's not but for example, this guy is not a graphing because <coughs> if you take a set here and take all the neighbors here, uh, then uh, they don't they are not the same uh, cardinality. So if you integrate on one, you get uh, so so for a set here and a set here, it, it matters which you integrate and which you count. Uh, <laughs> so this double counting is sort of the, the symmetry, it's basically the analog of the symmetry of the adjacent matrix on directed graphs, basically. Uh, it, it, it's, this is symmetric. Mm -hmm. This is symmetric with respect to this. Oh, yeah. uh, no, it's the 45 degrees. Oh. Here is another uh, nice graphing. Uh, you take uh, now the, the boundary of this circle, the, the line of this circle is your space, and you connect two points if, if they uh, uh, are at a, a distance alpha. So you, we, we think of this as the length one, so alpha should be irrational. Uh, in this case, uh, if you start and work out what's, uh, what's the neighborhood of that point, turns out that all you can do is to go in one way or the other by alpha steps, so it's a two-way infinite path. Uh, so the components are two-way two infinite path, and that's a graphing, it's uh, hard to see. Or you can take uh, <coughs> two uh, uh, irrational, different, uh, linear and independent irrational uh, ports and do the same. In this case, the components will be grids because from this point you can go like beta, back alpha, uh, beta, so you get this four lengths of four. So it's it's the same thing. Actually, the, you get the same graphs when you take the whole square as your underlying set and you connect two points either if they are horizontally at distance beta or vertically at distance alpha. So you get then a, 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 just an infinite grid for every connected component. And now here is a, this is really has nothing to do with the topic, but I just wanted it, it, it's a nice graphing with the Penrose styling. I don't know, probably most of you are familiar with Penrose stylings. So there are several versions. So in this version, you, you have two, two kinds of rhombi. The, you can you can uh, tie the whole plane, but there's no periodic tiling of the whole plane. Um, and uh, it's it's very it's a very nice subject, and uh, it turns out that this uh, also comes from a from a graphing. <coughs> In this case, you take a rhombic hypotenuse. It's some kind of uh, classical polyhedron. You slice it through all its uh, all its vertices. It's the lowest vertex, the highest vertex, and you get five uh, four slices. <coughs> and then you take uh, just the uh, connect two of the points if if their distance is parallel to one of the, the edges coming out of the two. And now this. This is a graphing, so it's an uncountable graph. But if you pick any point here and trace out its, uh, its uh, connected component, you get a, a, a Penrose tiling. And you get every Penrose tiling this way. 
So a random Penrose tiling is taking a random point. This or that one. So it's it's uh, so so these graphings are really some new subjects. But uh, uh, so I will be interested in algorithms which also work on graphings, not only this kind of the infinite transition. But I I will uh, not not talk about finite first. So um, I have the, this was our definition uh, of the this separation number for sinus k. If you you can generalize this to any graph, but you want to find the minimum measure of an edge. So a total measure of edges will be one, and it's a minimum measure of an edges, an edge set that uh, splits the graph into the graphing in the connected components of size at least k. And uh, the graphing is called hyperfinite, and that uh, if if uh, this number goes to zero if k tends to infinity, which means that uh, you can delete arbitrary small fraction of the edges and make all connected components uh, at most size k. But k, you have to choose a larger and larger k for this to work. And um, um, so I. Uh, yeah. But it, it should be always the case, no? Because bound to be the. No, no, it was a counter. Or oh, um, uh, an infinite tree, for example, does not have this property. Well, I, I don't. Uh, it's uh, an infinite tree is not a graph. It's just a countable graph. But you can. <coughs> you can uh, Define and graphing where every connected component is an infinite tree, and uh, uh, that will not work. There are other examples. Uh, in fact, uh, this notion comes from group theory, and uh, they have this notion of uh, amenable groups. It's known that not every group is amenable, and the corresponding graph is hyperfinite. <coughs> the group is amenable. So it's, it, this was actually started by group theorists under a different name, and maybe a, a different uh, approach. So, um, uh, if you pick a point x, it has a connected component, I call it g of x. And uh, if I take uh, this x randomly, and this g of x is a, it's a connected graph because it's a connected component. It's rooted because this x is uh, specified. Um, it has also the same bound and <coughs> degree, so of course it's countable. And uh, it's random because it, it, it shows it's random. So it's some kind of probability distribution on these objects. And that was the first uh, uh, definition of a limit object for convergence graph sequences on the Benjamin H. Schramm. It's called the unimodular random network. Uh, but uh, I, I will not talk about that much. But uh, let's look at two graphs, G1 and G2 graphings. I say that they are locally equivalent. If you take randomly a point x, you have a probability distribution on, on this connected component, and you should get the same probability distribution for, from the other one. Um, as an example, uh, no, actually, before showing you an example, uh, one way of guaranteeing this is something called a local isomorphism. So, of course, if the two are isomorphic in the usual mathematical sense, then, then of course, whatever you get, these probability distributions are the same. Now, there is a little bit more general notion for local isomorphism. Uh, technically, it's a measure-preserving map, 
and uh, for every point, it should be an isomorphism between the connected component containing this point and the connected component in the other containing the image of that. It's a natural notion. It's, it, it can sort of collapse the isomorphic connected components. That's all it can do. Uh, and uh, if, if such an isomorphism exists that proves local equivalence, so here is an example. Uh, we have seen these two graphings. We have seen that all the connected components are just infinite grids. So it follows that whatever map we take, a point here has the same uh, uh, connected components as here. So it gets uh, well, so Can you break us down? How do we think of a network from how do we generate the network? Oh, yeah. Well, this will be an uninteresting network. Okay. Uh, but uh, a network you get is that you pick a point, uh -huh. and then you look at all points which you can reach from it by I steps see. alpha or beta <coughs> in any order. So this would be a line of nodes, right? In no, it's uh, because you can step alpha and then beta, but you can also step beta and then beta, and it's, it's not a single line. In fact, it will be a grid, okay. just a, a square grid, isomorphic. Oh, because we're starting from the same point towards alpha and beta at the same yeah. time. I see, so I'm, I'm making two links right away from that node. And Actually, then four, go. because you can go with alpha in the other direction. I see. And then always I go with alpha, or I occasionally change alpha to beta? You can arbitrarily change alpha to beta. I see. That's how you get the uh, large and larger parts. And because it's irrational, it will be an infinite one because I will never return to the same. You will never area. return to the same. I see. So and this will not unless be unless it really Alpha plus beta is the same as beta plus alpha. So, and that's so it will be a growing grid. Like it's a growing grid. Yeah. <coughs> so it's not very interesting as a graph. Okay. But uh, of course, uh, number theorists love this. Uh, now you can, and here you have uh, the square, now you can map the square onto the circle by assigning to that the pair x, y, x plus pi, minus one, one, and it's easy to see that that's a local isomorphism, but the other way around not, so it's inverse is not. Um, and then there is a theorem which says that these, these two are uh, uh, locally equivalent, and only if there is a third one which has local isomorphism. Okay. That's just the background that we have not uh, proved it or sketch it. Okay, so these uh, graphs are, these graphings are actually hyperfinite. Um, it's easy to see for this guy. Um, because uh, if you take uh, two arbitrary narrows, uh, uh, strips of points, and you delete all the edges which have an endpoint in here, then uh, it's not hard to see that every, for whatever you start, it's only a finite number of parts or bounded actually about one over epsilon. And uh, of that part, and then you have to step into this blue, blue strip. Um, uh, the other one is not trivial. The same trick will not work. You can take a, a small piece here, and you can still have an infinite part, which always jumps over that. So mm -hmm. um, now, uh, why, why, uh, why is uh, hyperfinite uh, graphs interesting probably from the network side? It's because a family of finite graphs, uh, first of all, you have to define and look at finite graphs. Now, a single finite graph is always hyperfinite because you can just take k large enough. But uh, so we have to talk about the family or maybe a sequence of family of finite graphs, we say that it's hyperfinite if for 
for every epsilon, if you choose k large enough, then the separation numbers will be less than epsilon uniformly over the whole family. Same k works for the whole family. And if this is the case, then this is a nice family. Uh, first of all, there are many nice families which are hyperfinite. Some figure of one class piece, but for example, all planar graphs is hyperfinite. Every non-trivial minor cross property don't worry if you don't know what it means. It's, a, it's a, some kind of uh, uh, nice, uh, uh, useful property of a family of graphs to have. So think of planar graphs. All planar graphs form a hyperfinite family. Not all families, there are these expander graphs which are, uh, which are sort of expanding <laughs> and, uh, uh, and they are not hyperfinite. These are graphs which are very difficult to construct except by random hypothesis. They are used to all the other graphs. Now, there is a surprising theorem by Newman and Solar, also building on some related work uh, and extensions, which says that every graph property is testable with the local test sense for any family of hyperfinite graphs. So if you have, a, you want to know whether these graphs have arbitrary complicated graph property, it doesn't even have to be algorithmically decide about that property. If you are only interested in a hyperfinite family, then you can, you can uh, test it by local tests. That's a very general theorem which tells us that these hyperfinite graphs are interesting. Uh, excuse me, the, the local tests themselves are, also, uh, in, in case it's not algorithmically defined, local tests are also not algorithmic somehow? Um, well, uh, the local tests, I mean, it, it's not algorithmic computable, but you have an epsilon and then there is a k, and then if you can test it up to size k, and maybe you do it by just uh, knowing that. Yeah. So, but yes, you're, you're right, I mean, uh, obviously. Uh, but uh, the pro so, so I think the fact thing is that the property has to be tax testable on bounded size graphs, and then it works. So, so how does it work for what's like distribution? Um, uh, well, basically, you have to find this hyperfinite graphs. You delete a very small fraction of edges. I mean, I didn't define, I mentioned that this testability allows a little bit of an error. Otherwise, obviously, you cannot do it. I mean, uh, uh, the graph may have some very bad spot somewhere. So, if the graph is triangle free, I mean, you can test, test up the property, but if, the, if, if it has a single triangle somewhere out very far, you will never find it by having a choice. So, so the testable local, by local test, just sketch at the beginning uh, is uh, you, you delete a small fraction of, of the edges and uh, you have to find that and then you have to somehow uh, uh, be able to test it for all these uh, finite things uh, and of course it's more difficult than that but uh, so it's interesting is this divide and conquer. Yeah. But the proof doesn't give you some some algorithm that says, oh, give you give me the graph property and I give you the way to test it. It's sort of it's more of an existence proof that says any graph yes. property you give me, there is some yeah. some yeah, algorithm that, that you can probably probably that, oh. that can be. Yeah. Yeah. And this is actually somewhat analogous to the case of graphs in the three bits where many graph properties are known to be testable in the time for graphs to come the three bits. Uh, in fact, there are some very general results about that. So, so in this case, these, these graphs are, are uh, somewhat similar and uh, probably 
would be interesting to have some efficient versions of this, but I don't know. <coughs> um, and there is a theorem by the late Buddha Trump, which says that if a sequence of graphs tends to a graphing in the local sense, in the sense I described, then this family of these graphs is hyperfinite if and only if the limit is hyperfinite. Now, these kind of statements are usually not very difficult to prove, but that actually is, is, is quite tricky. Um, that Sean just published a sketch of the proof, it, it, and, and then he died in a, a climbing accident. And uh, there was another proof published by Ben Rubini Schramm and uh, Shapira and Schramm and the posthumous paper of Schramm. And that was uh, based on different ideas. But uh, uh, what I will tell you is sort of builds on Schramm's original ideas. Okay. Um, so what's the definition of a graph? Graphing being hyperfinite. Uh, graphing. Being hyperfinite. We this, what it says. Uh, well, graphing hyperfinite. That this was that this. Uh, um, was here somewhere? Yeah, yeah graphing is hyperfinite if you can delete a smaller and smaller fraction of all edges. We have all the remain all the components of size at most k. So for every k there is an epsilon this fraction. So that it's uh, it's really not essentially infinite. So you can make it all the components finite by a small fraction, anything that's small fraction. Now um, I I was here somewhere. And so this is a, a theorem. Um, in fact, the, the main part of the proof is to prove that if two, of, if two graphings are locally equivalent, so they give rise to the same distribution on the connected components, then one is hyperfinite if and only if the other one is. And, uh, OK, so we know that if these are locally equivalent, that means that there's a third one and there are these local isomorphisms of this third one into both of these. Now, say G1 is hyperfinite, that means I can delete a small fraction of edges in G1 so that all the components will be small. Um, I can take the inverse image, and then it's not hard to see that this has the same small fraction and all the components will be small. But now, if you want to, want to take the image of that, the problem is that the image of a set of small measure can have large measure. And therefore, it's, it doesn't work here. Um, I, uh, here is, here is a, immediately our, uh, this example shows that <clears throat> if you have uh, this map, and you remember we had this, uh, <coughs> this set here which split it into small components. Now the image of this set is everything. You didn't get it. Nevertheless, it's true that this is hyperfinite, but it's not so easy to prove except for this. Um, now, uh, I will... That's for the very mathematically minded of you. If you have a measure preserving mapping between two spaces, this could, you, could, you can think of it like take, so what measure preserving, it's a misnomer. It, it, the inverse is measure preserving. So for example, if you project a square onto one of its edges, it's a measure preserving map because if you take any measurable subset of the edge, you take the inverse image, it has the same measure. Um, and uh, if you have a measure-preserving map, then if you have a set here, its inverse image has the same measure. 
so you can pull back things, uh, small sets. Now, what can you, what you want to push forward? What can you push forward? You can push forward a measure, because if you have a measure here, and you want to know what's the measure of a set here, take the image and you take the measure. And uh, now you have to switch to your uh, finite combinatorial optimizer mind. And in combinatorial optimization, we do this often that we have a set, and then instead we would like we consider a measure. It's uh, called the linear relaxation. Or of course, you can think of fuzzy sets also. It's sort of the same idea. But I'm, I'm coming from combinatorial optimization, so I put in the linear relaxation. And now, if you have a measure, you can push it forward to here. And uh, OK, I think I'm, I will skip some technical details here, but uh, it's just some. Definition, you look at all connected subgraphs, you know, they have sized at most k, you know the set by rk, and uh, now if you have a, this kind of optimal edge separator, you look at the subgraphs into which it's separated, they form a family F, and uh, now you can assign a trivial way a kind of uh, Sigma y. It's easy to check this set up to one. So you get a probability distribution. Let me skip the technical details because I think I'm close to the time I wanted to, I, I, I can use. But uh, anyway, so the uh, going through this, you have a probability distribution on set on these subgraphs of size k. The marginal is uniform, so if you pick a set, a subset, and you pick a random point of it, you get uniform. And the expected expansion of this is exactly this. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what you are after. And this is now a linear relaxation because there's nothing integer here. Probably distribution, you just want to find these numbers. And, uh, but unfortunately, once you forget the definition, this is not, you get here a different number, which is called the linear relaxation of this, of this number. Uh, this uh, star of G. So the combinatorial optimization way of thinking about this is that you, you think of everything as an optimization problem in zero one variables, and then you just instead of insist and you write everything in linear with linear constraints, that's not hard. And then you forget about the condition that, that you have zero one variables, you allow the variables to be between zero and one, and then you get the linear relaxation, the optimization problem. And uh, this make, makes sense for all graphics not only in the finite setting. And uh, uh, <coughs> the theorem is that uh, this, this linear relaxation, that's uh, the trivial part that gives a lower bound, because you are allowed to do more. You are not only allowed to, to pick a subset of the edges, but you are allowed to pick a kind of fuzzy subset <coughs> of the edges, so you have, you have more freedom in choosing. But the upper bound is uh, only a logarithmic factor verse. And that's, uh, that's the essential theorem. And it's important that it has no dependence on k. So why is this any good? So here is you know, this trying to prove that this is hyperfinite. And that guy is hyperfinite. So we start with this, g1. As before, we put it back to G2, so far everything is fine. If these, these are just uh, split G1 into small components, these are just split G2 into small. With G into small components, now we think of this as a measure, 
it's a very special measure, concentrated on just these edges. So. And now you can push down this measure. And now, the, by the previous theorem, you don't lose much by pushing it down. If this was a measure epsilon, uh, then from this you can extract an integer, so a true set of edges, which is only a logarithmic factor, of course. And, uh, and so this, uh, this completes this argument. The algorithm, uh, that's maybe my last uh, uh, sentence here, or last slide here. The algorithm is a kind of greedy algorithm. You, in the finite case, you can say that you start and select uh, subsets. These are connected subsets of size at most k, okay. so that each of them minimizes the number of edges that it, it's left relative to the new number of points it covers. So, so in other words, you want to find a set y which covers many new points, but uh, but uh, uh, the, the boundary is small. And then if you delete all the edges that are in the boundaries of this guy, and one can prove that this, uh, this works. Uh, now this is the classical algorithm setting. It doesn't work for local algorithms because, because uh, you, you, you have to work very, very long if you have a huge and, and in particular, it doesn't work for graphings at all, because the uh, you would have to select an uncountable set of things. But uh, but you can do it in, in phases, so you can sort of simultaneously parallel select an uh, uncountable number of these things. It's an additional trick, uh, and that actually does lead to local algorithms. So, uh, all together, uh, okay, before, <laughs> uh, one more sentence here. So, uh, this does lead to, to an algorithm, local algorithm, which decomposes a network into small pieces, bounded size pieces, at the cost of deleting only slightly more edges than you absolutely have to. You don't find the best one, but you find up, up to this. So instead of something of size epsilon, you find something of size epsilon times log one over epsilon, which still tends to zero. So, uh, I'm trying to propose the idea that once you have this decomposition, maybe you can also do interesting things and determine interesting properties, at least for hyperfinite graphics. I think it would be interesting to try to see if real life families of finite graphs, or a single very large graph in which case describe the dependence of epsilon and k, whether they are indeed often hyperfinite. I, I think they must be often hyperfinite because, uh, because exactly because it's very difficult to construct a graph which is not It's the expander problem. It's, it's, it has been open for a while. Uh, Margulis got the fields method in part for constructing such a graph. So, so it's a, not only for that, but for some of his uh, important achievements. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it would be interesting to, to find some sort of why I will talk about this. Too. Thank you. So when I actually listen to Lot, uh, to Lot he, uh, explain the way he thinks about graphs, I keep wondering how did Ado Sherini think about the random graphs when they proposed it, right? And what was the line of thinking they went through? Because we have a very practical way of presenting random networks, like is it your randomly try to connect people and things like that. And the motivation is purely practical for us. 
and not mathematical. And the way you think about this problem is really the developed ideas are coming from mathematics rather than the practical thinking. So, so I guess the first question I would ask to kind of uh, uh, you know started is that you kind of alluded to the fact at the end that there is perhaps it would be interesting to see whether real graphs have this hyperfinite property. Is there a simple test that we can actually do if I if if, if we have the map of the world by the or the internet or the cell? Um, would there be <coughs> something to measure it and say yes or no? Um, uh, well, um, this algorithm basically, which I mentioned, could be or should be used. Although, so in, for a finite graph, it it is really determining a function between epsilon and k. So what fraction of the edges you have to delete? It's always a finite uh, fraction, but what fraction of the edges you have to delete to get mm -hmm. size of uh, It's a robustness uh, problem or, in our language. Sorry? It's a robustness problem in our language. Yeah. It's kind of how you break the yeah. network into place. How can you, how yeah. many edges you have to delete to break it into small parts? But there are sequences of growing networks. That's where it can be tested. Well, um, well, if, if, the, if the network is very large, what I would say is you, you, you have a function of epsilon and k, and then at some point it breaks down because once you are up to the size of the network, then it makes no sense. But up to that, it would be interesting to see whether indeed uh, the, uh, let's say it as a function of k, the epsilon does seem to tend to zero. It will never be zero, of course, but maybe it will be eventually of the order of the one over the number of nodes or something like that. That would be an indication that, I mean, I, I'm sure you can meaningfully define some version of this notion in a finite network, and once you have that, it's a very famous In connection with this, so do you have any kind of uh, Classification of graphing depending on how fast uh, <coughs> epsilon converges. To be. Um, I don't, but but that's uh, that would be a a, 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 a good project. I, uh, it's it's difficult question <coughs> actually even for this uh, Diophantine uh, Dirichlet graphing. You know the circle with two alpha beta. Mm -hmm. I was trying to ask number theorists whether they. And tell it, and they couldn't. Also, oh, simply to answer, what is the function? You, you, you don't know in this case. Yeah, I think yeah. it should depend on the algebraic complexity of that. It probably depends. It probably depends on, on the algebraic curve. Yeah. Is it possible to visualize the uh, separator for mm. the disk? Um, not really. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's everywhere. It's okay. small pieces everywhere. I mean, it might be doable. I, I would be very interested in seeing it. <laughs> it would be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is uh, are there non-expander, uh, uh, non-hyperfinite uh, <laughs> graphings which are not expanders? Is they, or are they very are they the same? So you said oh. expanders, are example of non-hyperfinite. Yeah. Uh, but is it more than just expanders? Is it? Oh, um, there is a theorem by Kaimanovich which says that uh, if it's not hyperfinite, then in some weak sense it contains an expander. So, but it doesn't have to be an expander. It could it just has to contain in some somewhere with some maybe subdivision and so on. So G and M with um, K over N, uh, it's a uh, A random graph, D regular, with its bounded degree, so probably you want a D regular random graph. It's, it's, it's an expanded, it's not hyperfinite. There's a question in the back. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. just a clarification question. So, so if you want uh, to show for a family of graphs that uh, certain properties certain properties testable, then you would take this family of graphs, show that the graphing is hyper so and send the limit graphing 
so that the graph line, that the graph line is cyber finite, and then be able to go back and say that the family is testing. Is, is that kind of a pipeline? That would be one possibility, yeah. Yeah, because in some cases, <coughs> It's, it's probably easier to find these sets for the limit. I mean, like in the, in the case of the, uh, I think, the toroidal grids, so you know, uh, uh, it, uh, it was quite easy to describe this. If you, if you look at sequences of graphs which converge to this, you can do it still, but it's easier. And then the test that you would run would be visualization. I think uh, that would be, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have not tried to program this, so it's probably <laughs> a, probably uh, a tricky to, to do it right. But in principle, it's a, it's a valid, finite local algorithm. There are no more questions. Let's thank Laszlo for taking us to this.